So my name is Michelle Wiener. I am an interventional pain management physician. I work with Spine and Wellness Centers of America. We're a pretty large uh, pain practice in South Florida from Palm Beach to Kendall. Um, I today talking about therapeutic uses of cannabis. We try to focus more on wellness in our pain practice and I hope you get that just today. Uh, Carlos, it's funny because Carlos is a friend of mine. After I took the eight hour CME course, uh, the first thing I did was called Carlos um, because there's a lot that we don't learn during that course and he actually led me to a lot of people who have educated me over the past year. So today we're going to review the history of cannabis. We're going to talk about uh, physiology and the endocannabinoid system. We're going to review some literature, talk about uh, the impact on healthcare, and then the patient-doctor relationship and the doctor's role. So cannabis has been used for thousands of years throughout different cultures for different disorders, anxiety, insomnia, seizures. Uh, it was in the mid-1900s that there was a significant decrease in the education, and this was mainly because of the Marijuana Tax Act, which then, when they determined that uh, cannabis was a Schedule I drug in um, 1970, there was a decrease in, in education and, and research. So in order to be Schedule I, which is like heroin, cocaine, LSD, there has to be no medical use, it has to be abusive and lack evidence. So because marijuana is still a Schedule I, there's a lack of um, ability to do research and it makes it very difficult for, for clinical trials on humans. The endocannabinoid system was discovered in the mid-1980s, uh, early 1990s. So people are using cannabis and there's physiological changes in the body. So uh, a guy named Meshulam in Israel and a lot of other people were looking into why this is so they decided that this system is really about balance. It's about homeostasis. It affects many of our systems throughout the body. Perhaps some deficiencies may be actually a deficiency in your endocannabinoid system. Maybe people need cannabis daily. Maybe they need it just to maintain their, their homeostasis. So these are some landmark discoveries. Um, in particular, most important things for you know non-medical people, and I kind of look at you guys as all potential patients, or you may have family members that are, you know, in need of this. So it's good for you guys to understand the science and be passionate about it for yourself or, or for family members. So in the early 1990s, they discovered there are CB1 and CB2 receptors. These receptors, CB1, are in the central nervous system, mainly the brain uh, and other organs. And CB2 is mainly in the periphery. It's for immune cells, for um, your tonsils, your spleen, different, uh, different organs in your abdomen, and there are ligands, there's endogenous cannabinoids. So if you use cannabis, cannabis binds to your CB1 or CB2 receptor, but then they discover there's actually an internal system and there's endogenous cannabinoids in our body called anandamide and 2-AG that are always working since we're born for uh, maintaining our homeostasis. Not to bore you guys too much, but pretty much the, the a gist of the physiology, you have the CB1 and CB2 receptors, different locations throughout the body. They are made from these phospholipids and they're in all of our systems. They are produced as we need them and then rapidly degraded into inactive substances. And they are different from other substances because they act with retrograde suppression. So basically, they work on the postsynaptic uh, neurons. So you see the EC is the endocannabinoid. That is basically binding like a lock to the CB1 receptor, which will cause GABA to increase and a lot of other neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin to increase. That can affect your mood. But it's a different system. It's a postsynaptic system. So, there are many cannabinoids within cannabis. There's over you know, 100 substances. It's not just THC and CBD that everybody hears about. There's many different types. And when, as a physician, and in the future in Florida, we hope to 
personalize and individualize cannabis so that you are able to pick the right profile. And it's not just THC and, and CBD. And they all, there's tons of research on all of them, and they all have different properties, many different types. So um, they were talking before about CBN may be good for sleep, or CBC is an anti-inflammatory. So there's more than just CBD and THC. In particular, this is what we know the most about. This is what's available for, for Florida right now in the dispensaries. Um, there's a lot of evidence about the ratios and different profiles. And as the dispensaries evolve, I hope that you know, the, the, what's, what's available in terms of cannabis will evolve as well in Florida. Um, to, to differentiate, CBD is the non-psychoactive. So THC is known as the substance that causes more of the euphoria. Um, CBD's main, CBD has many roles. One of the best roles of CBD is to mitigate the negative effects of THC. So a lot of times people use THC and they don't like their high, right? The, the, the point of CBD is actually to decrease the psychotropic effect of THC. And uh, besides it being a great anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety, very safe, but it does um, help out with the negative effects of THC, which is important, which is why when you have something like a synthetic drug like Marinol that's just THC, you're missing the CBD component, you're missing a lot of other components. THC, it has a lot of great properties. It's antispasmodic, uh, anti-neoplastic, um, analgesic. It's known for um, decreasing nausea with chemo patients and also increasing appetite. So they have a similar onset. Um, obviously, inhalation or sublingual would be, would be a faster route as opposed to edibles could, or um, you know, ingestion could be an hour or two, depending on the person, could be longer. Uh, the half-life is different, though. THC's half-life is seven days, and CBD is uh, much quicker. So an important part to note is that people, I do believe it's very safe, but you have to understand that it also works with certain uh, enzymes in your body that other drugs work on. And so it's not that, for example, uh, opioids, maybe they use the cytochrome uh, P450 or 3A4. What happens, it's not that you're getting more high from the THC, but it's actually increasing your opioid bioavailability. So you're actually getting high from your opioid. So there, there is a lot of drugs that, that do interact that you have to be careful. Okay, the medical benefits. Obviously, this is a, a picture that shows that, you know, multiple um, cannabinoids have multiple effects. I sp I'm a pain management doctor, and I think in, you know, the United States, lots of people have pain, especially in Florida. Lots of people are on opioids. I just wanted to review so you understand there is a lot of science, a lot of evidence about the physiology of pain management and, and the use of cannabis. So it's not just that it's a great anti-inflammatory or that it, it makes you um, in this different state of mind that you're able to forget about your pain. There's actually lots of evidence showing it works on trip B1, it works on uh, the dorsal root ganglion to inhibit the pain signals. And there's a lot of evidence showing that the um, things like fibromyalgia, chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome, these disorders that have no true um, no true etiology, you can't do a biopsy, you can't do blood work, you're not gonna find anything. It may actually just be a deficiency in the endocannabinoid system, and there's a lot of evidence showing this. This is a, a huge slide showing the multiple uh, systems within our body and how the, the physiology, for example, let's talk about the GI tract, you know, colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome. There's a lot of evidence showing that it can suppress GI motility, decrease intestinal secretions, reflux. Um, for, for dementia, for example, it, it is known as a neuroprotectant. It can actually inhibit the aggregation of amyloid plaque, which is what um, is the cause of, of Alzheimer's in particular. And uh, PTSD is an interesting one. So there's effect on uh, acetylcholine, and this, this affects your memory. Um, what's funny is that um, we're always talking about memory, but you, you can also think about the ability to forget. So for example, if I'm looking at all you right now, 
and I had to remember all of your faces all day long, or you're walking and you're, the, the ability to forget is such an important physiological ability that we, we, we don't think about on a daily basis. But the fact that, that it does affect your, your memory can also be therapeutic for certain people, for example, in PTSD. Um, mood and depression, it, it can be an antidepressant. It affects your dopamine and serotonin neurotransmitters. And for cancer, it's been shown to uh, induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and inhibit angiogenesis, which basically gives blood supply to tumors, can inhibit metastasis. Lots of things. Glaucoma decreases intraocular pressure, and osteoporosis is a big one because it actually can increase your osteoblasts, which form bone, and decrease the um, osteoclast activity and cartilage loss as well, and, and can help with, with uh, bone healing. So literature review, if it was like two months ago, I probably would have had a lot more slides and different presentation, but there was this huge article that came out, 396 page report, looking at 10,000 research studies. And they found 100 different conclusions. And they broke it down into um, substantial evidence, moderate evidence, and limited evidence. And so this is basically just a review of the evidence. So the review of what, what is out there in, in the literature. So they found conclusively that there's substantial evidence that marijuana treats chronic pain, nausea and vomiting in cancer patients undergoing chemo, as well as spasticity and multiple sclerosis. So there's conclusive and substantial evidence in the literature for those. In terms of uh, smoking marijuana, it's not associated with lung, head, or neck cancers. And there's moderate to limited evidence that marijuana is therapeutic in insomnia, increasing appetite in HIV AIDS patients, decreasing anxiety, and combating uh, PTSD. They also looked at the risks. So there's evidence that regular marijuana smokers are, are more likely to have chronic bronchitis. However, this can be reversed when they stop smoking. And this is, again, on smokers. So Right now, we can actually recommend anything that's uh, besides, you know, vapor, pills, uh, oil. There's no smoking. So this is evidence about smoking. There's evidence about a link with prenatal cannabis exposure and low birth weight. There's a lot of um, evidence showing that a lot of these patients are also using tobacco at the same time, and this can be a confounding variable there. And in terms of schizophrenia, there's a lot of controversy with um, psychiatric disorders. So they said it's not clear whether, whether there's evidence showing increased risk of, of developing schizophrenia, but it's not clear whether these patients were turning to marijuana as self-medication. And there's also a difference between a link and a correlation versus causation. It's not that uh, marijuana will cause schizophrenia, but there's a link in the use. So the, the bottom line is that a lot more research needs to be done. The problem is it's a Schedule I drug. Now speaking about, um, so we talked a little bit about endogenous cannabinoids in our body. We talked about, obviously, phyto, meaning medical cannabis as the plant. What's available in terms of synthetic? So if you're a physician, you can prescribe mar uh, Marinol or Sesamet, which is for um, AIDS, or chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. There's Sativex, which is not available in the US. This is actually one of the only THC, CBD com combinations, and that's for muscle spasms and MS. And then what's interesting is this one, um, which is for the treatment of obesity. So if you think about it, THC causes an increase in appetite. So if you're gonna block the CB1 receptor, which is where THC binds, you would think it would, it would cause weight loss. Um, the biggest side effect is obviously gonna be nausea. So you're gonna, you're gonna you know, it, it can possibly help with obesity, but the patient's probably gonna be nauseous all day long. So the, the, the bottom line is there's something called an entourage effect. The entourage effect basically says that the whole flower, the, the plant itself, is really the most beneficial because you have all of the cannabinoids. It's not just the, the THC or the CBD, you have everything together working in synergy to help with many different symptoms. Impact on, on healthcare. So let's first look at opioid use, okay? 
So in the states that mar uh, medical marijuana is legal, over the course of five years, there's been a 30% decrease in opioid fatalities. That's a, a huge number. Um, there's 80 people that die every day from opioid use and 200 million prescriptions, opioid prescriptions that are written in the US. There, there has been, there's been not one death from the use of marijuana and this is because the receptors, the CB1, CB2 receptors are not in your brainstem. They're not where uh, your respiratory drive is being controlled as opposed to, to opioids. In terms of addiction, there's been evidence that there's a 9% rate of addiction. Now this is a very overinflated number and the reason why is because first of all, say you were arrested for possession of marijuana or using marijuana. Perhaps the judge says to you, do you want to go to an addiction treatment center or do you want this other punishment? So then all these people who use marijuana go to an addiction treatment center and there, there starts the increase in this, this uh, addiction rate number. Also maybe they're using it for medicinal reasons. So there is this increase in dopamine which gives you the desire to want to use it, but it's not an addiction in the sense that if you stop, there's no withdrawal effect. There's no harmful um, side effect. There, there can be tolerance to cannabis and then you can maybe switch the strain, but in terms of addiction, I think with, with, with cannabis you still need to use it in moderation, but it's more of a desire and a treatment than a true addiction. Uh, there's also lots of evidence that they're using it for opioid withdrawal. So people who are on opioids who want to stop using opioids, they have a lot of uncomfortable symptoms and marijuana actually can mitigate a lot of these symptoms. It's probably not going to be accepted in the addiction world right away, but it, it could be a good option. Um, bigger studies, just in general, a lot of the studies are not, are, are not on humans. A lot of them are these retrospective studies that in the states that it's legal, for example, there's fewer traffic fatalities in medical marijuana law states. Um, there's also a decrease in the prescription drug use that estimated to be four six, $468 million decreased annually in drug spending. There's uh, evidence showing that marijuana use is associated with better in-hospital survival rates. So patients who are, for example, cancer patients, they, um, they actually are, their mortality rate is, is decreased in, in the hospital. This, this is funny, this is, this, I walked into my mom's house the other day and she had this magazine and she's a member of this organization. The, the point of this slide is to say that there's been a 250% increase in the use of cannabis in the 65 years and up. So this is, this is, those are the patients that I'm seeing. I'm seeing the patients who are older who are saying, I've tried everything, I've had side effects, I can't use this. I want medical marijuana, and, and, and it's, it's usually this population. Okay, so the physician's role. Physicians, um, my, main, my main goal is to figure out what the objective, what, 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 what am I treating? What does the patient want to uh, need assistance with? And obviously as physicians, we are patient advocates. We want to educate other physicians. We want to educate the patient, but we want to know is the patient having uh, you know, difficulty sleeping because of pain? So do I need to treat the pain? Do I need to treat the sleep? Do they have a specific disorder? Are they having these symptoms because of an endocannabinoid deficiency? You want to know the objective. Then uh, comes the dosing, the strain, the delivery system. Do you want something that's short acting? Do you want something that works immediate? And you have to know their previous history. Have they ever used uh, cannabis before? And any psych history, what's their what's their intention, what's, their, what's the objective? And then monitoring's a big deal. So there's a lot of issues and frustrations. Uh, the three-month relationship is the most absurd thing. I have terminal patients in the hospital that will probably die before that three-month relationship, which means that, I mean, it's not even like, it's not even you know an exception if you're terminal. You still have to wait the three months. I could give the patient any opioid in the world, but I can't give them medical marijuana. Uh, access is a problem if there's 
um, seven dispensaries right now and only a few of them have maybe high THC and some of them are running out of their oil and, and patients, I'm giving a patient a recommendation for something and they're getting something else from the dispensary because the dispensary ran out. The cost also is a big issue. The eight hour CME class has to be adjusted. It has to be more um, beneficial for the physician so that when we finish the course, we're able to not call you know, friends and, and we can actually learn during this course. Uh, and then also as a physician, you have to be passionate about this. You, you want to help the patients in the right way. You want to advocate for them and you want to educate yourself. It's not, it's not something we learned in medical school. So we all need to keep educating ourselves. Telemedicine is another, um, another topic. I think that the, in terms of this telemedicine, there's a lot of patients that maybe can't get to your office. There's a lot of patients that are very sick. However, I think you should at least have one visit with the physician to do a good physical and history before you can do telemedicine and, and follow up and monitor. And then pre-qualifying for, for physicians, are they doing that? Um, online or people sending in medical records and they're pre-qualifying them, do they need a visit? So there's, there's a lot of questions as a physician if you want to start doing this to think about before you actually initiate the process. So this is my last slide. The, the bottom line is lots of research needs to be done, but there's a lot of evidence already. I think it's funny that the U.S. has five patents already on cannabis showing, uh, and it's still a Schedule One showing you know, it, it's useful for, for uh, nausea and vomiting, it's an antioxidant, it's neuroprotective, um, uh, anti-inflammatory, cancer, apoptosis. So I just wanted to leave you with that because the most important thing is really, for me, education and advocating for, for the patients. Thank you.